have ever read the letters of Paul in the New Testament, then you probably realized that Paul loved athletics. And I bet Paul admired the rigors and discipline and focus required of athletes because he so often reverts to athletic analogies to convey spiritual truth. And he loves the race metaphor. He speaks of running to win in 1 Corinthians 9.24. He speaks of running with purpose in 1 Corinthians 9.26. He speaks of running well in Galatians 5.17. He talks about finishing the race in 2 Timothy 4, 7. And in our passage, we find the same kind of brisk, energetic energy. Paul transports us to the Greek stadium and we hear the roar of the crowd. We feel the hard-packed clay beneath our toes. We see the field lined with runners ready to leap forward. And maybe you're wondering, why does Paul convey his truth with this racing metaphor? Because the simple fact is, the Christian life is a race. If you're a believer, you are meant to run, you are meant to win, you are meant to cross the finish line and receive the prize. You are not meant to sit in the stands. You are not meant to lounge in the grass. You are meant to pursue sanctification and ultimate Christ-likeness. And Philippians 3, 12 to 16 is your training regimen, the training regimen for every believer. Because in this passage, the Apostle Paul shares with us four training principles for running the Christian race. This is his training protocol. And it's like he steps up to the starting line because he's in the race too. And he begins to limber up his muscles and stretch. And then he looks at you and he says, hey, are you ready to run? Are you ready to win the prize? Then run with me, sweat with me, endure with me, win with me. That's the invitation in this text. Run with me, says Paul. And so my appeal to you is that you would suit up, step up, warm up and lace up, that you would race or run this race, that you would seek to win this prize because the Christian life is a race. There is sin to fight, there is holiness to pursue, and best of all, there's a Savior to enjoy. So let's get moving. And we'll begin with our first training principle, a holy discontent. First training principle, a holy discontent. You must possess this in order to run to win. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, But what's Paul talking about? What has he not obtained? Well, if you recall, in verses 1 to 11, Paul reflects on his own past and he confesses, hey, all of the things that I used to consider to be spiritual assets, namely things like my circumcision, my pure Jewish blood, my family heritage, my spiritual fervor, my religious observance. He says, all of those things that I used to think counted I realized they were liabilities. They don't matter. When I got converted, they were transferred from the asset to the liability column. And now he says, as a Christian, I see what matters. What matters is gaining Christ, knowing Christ, and being more like Christ. It's verses 9, 10, and 11. And he says, what I really want is to know more of the fullness of Christ in my life. I want to experience more of the sanctification-inspiring resurrection power of Jesus. I want to share greater communion with Christ as I suffer for Him. And I want to savor more of the sweetness of Jesus. But verse 12, he says, I have to humbly acknowledge to you, I have not arrived. Everything that I desire is not yet true of me. And why this humble confession? Why this humble acknowledgement that the great Apostle Paul hasn't yet arrived? Well, because in the context of the Philippian church, there was this group called Judaizers, and maybe you remember them. They were false teachers. They were Jewish, and they said, listen, if you're a Gentile, if you're going to be saved, you must keep the law of Moses. You must be circumcised. But if you do that, You can win God's favor. You can be saved. You can even achieve spiritual perfection. And we should know we've done it. We've achieved perfection. That's where the Jewish legalists were teaching. And so Paul knows that is a dangerous doctrine because if a Christian thinks that his race is already done, 
that he's already crossed the finish line, that he needs nothing else, or rather that he needs to do nothing else, then he won't seek to be holy. He won't seek to grow in Christ. He won't seek to love others. He'll just rest on his laurels. And so Paul wants to refute this unbiblical idea of perfectionism, that somehow you can, in a moment, achieve spiritual perfection. And he says, that's not true. And in my own life, he says, I've never, I've never experienced this perfection. And then, indeed, he repeats verse 13. Brothers, it's like he put his hands on his shoulders, and he looks you in the eye, and he says, listen to me. I do not consider that I've made it my own. He says, no, really, I'm not satisfied with my current spiritual maturity. Even I want to be more like Christ. Even I see that I have more ground to cover in my race for Jesus. I realized this as I was studying this week. Paul, when he wrote Philippians, had been a believer for 30 years, three decades. Well, as I preach this text, I've been a Christian for 30 years. And so I can understand, I can relate to what Paul is saying when he says, I haven't arrived because I look at my own life. And yes, I'm grateful for what God has done. But I realize as far as the Christian race is concerned, I've covered inches, not miles. And I'm nowhere near as godly as Paul. And yet even in my limited understanding, I say, man, I have so much further to go. Man, I wish I was more like Christ. I wish I treasured Jesus the way he ought to be. And you say, well, I get that for you, but I don't quite understand how Paul could say that. I mean, did anybody ever run as far in the Christian life as Paul? Did anybody achieve his level of sanctification? I mean, after all, he's the guy who lit a gospel torch and set the Mediterranean world ablaze for Jesus. So help me understand, how could Paul honestly say, I'm not content with where I'm at in my spiritual race? And by the way, he's not saying, I'm not saved. He's saying, no, as I live out this Christian life, there's so much more. And I think the commentator F.B. Meyer captures Paul's thought when when he says this, self-dissatisfaction lies at the root of our noblest achievements, which simply means the Christian who's running the race. He has a sense of gnawing dissatisfaction in his heart with his present spiritual condition. I didn't say position in Christ, his present spiritual condition, the true Christian is dissatisfied because he says, I want to strive for more of Christ demonstrated in me. I wanna have more love, more humility, more graciousness, more patience, more selflessness. I want Christ to be so visible in my life. And that's what Paul was saying. No matter how far I have progressed, I'm eager to strive after more progress. There was a runner, greatest distance runner maybe ever. He's an Ethiopian guy. His name is Haley Gebra Selassie. He's known as the emperor of distance running. His professional career spanned about 25 years. In his career, he, he broke almost 30 world records. He won two gold medals at the Olympics. He won eight world championships in running. And yet back in 2015, after he just won the Berlin Marathon, he just set a world record. The reporters swarmed. They put the microphone in in his face. They said, "Uh, you know, what are you going to say? And this is what he said. I can run faster. And I love it because what he's demonstrating there is the very same idea of Paul who said, no matter how far I've come in Christ, I want to run further and faster. And I want to enjoy more of the Savior. And I wonder, when you look at the mirror, is that what you say? I'm grateful what God has done in my life, but Lord, this isn't, this isn't the extent I want more. I want more of your power displayed in me. I want more of your righteousness displayed in me. Because I very much doubt that you are saying, you know what, maybe actually I am perfect. I don't think there's anything left for me to learn. I'm pretty much there. I doubt that's you. But what I do think is a very real struggle for Christians is to be complacent and to say, you know what? I'm saved. Like, I'm going to go to heaven. Why should I work hard in my sanctification? Like, isn't it enough just to be saved? Can I just rest in God's grace and do nothing? Well, yes, you should relish God's grace. But Paul is arguing in this text that to use grace 
as a reason for doing nothing. That's like running with a broken ankle. You just won't cover any ground. And as far as running a spiritual race, if you're content with where you're at, if you don't desire more godliness, then you're not willing to put forth any effort. You really don't try hard to put sin to death. And so Paul says, no, 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 no. If you're going to run to win, the first principle you got to grasp is you must have a holy discontent, not with Christ, but with the current level of your sanctification. And then he says, but that's not where it ends. No, second training principle is a holy discontent must be coupled with a consuming drive. Because in reality, a holy discontent fuels the consuming drive. Verse 12 not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. No, verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I know you caught the repetition there. I press on, verse 12. I press on, verse 14. What is he trying to convey to us? Well, that verb press on means to run swiftly in order to catch some person or thing. They use it of hunters, hunters pursuing the prey. But it also means to move rapidly and decisively toward an objective. And given that this context in Philippians 3 to 12 to 16 is very overtly athletic, then the idea here is there's the smell of sweat and the sound of footsteps thumping on the track. This is Paul sprinting and running. This is his legs pumping and his arms driving and his chest heaving and sweat streaming and his lungs burning. He's saying, I am pressing on. And that verb implies ongoing, unending, vigorous, strenuous, zealous, energetic pursuit. And you say, why so much effort? For what? Well, he explains in verse 12. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. What do you mean Christ Jesus has made me his own? Well, that word, make it my own, that's an intense verb. It means to aggressively grab something, to seize it, to grip it. And when Paul says Christ Jesus makes made me his own, he's taking us back 30 years. He's taking us back to conversion to the Damascus Road, where as Paul went to Damascus to arrest Christians and attack the church, as it were, Christ attacked Paul. And with a mighty hand, he grabbed Paul and he threw him into the dirt. And then he radically took over his life. And he made Paul his own. He apprehended and seized Paul. So when Paul says, I'm seeking to make it my own because he made me his own, He's telling you, this is what compels me and impels me forward. So we need to pause and say, well, then what was Christ's purpose in making Paul his own? Why the divine transaction of conversion in the Damascus dirt? The very same reason for which God saves any of us is the same reason for which he saved Paul. And that reason is explained in Romans 8, 29. For those whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. This is Christ's likeness. And that's repeated in Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Well, what is it intended to do? God's grace. What is it intended to do? Verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. Now verse 14, Speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And then at the end of the Bible, 1 John 3, 2, speaking of Christ, when he appears, we shall be like him. So do you see why Paul runs hard? Do you see why Paul sweats and strives and strains and stresses his muscles to move forward? It's not to win salvation. He runs because he has salvation. Winning of the salvation, that's what God did in Christ in verse nine. God gave Paul righteousness, a heavenly alien righteousness that he credited to Paul's account. That's justification that already occurred. Paul has salvation. So this running is not to win salvation. This running is because he has salvation. This is what we call sanctification. 
This is where Paul says, now that I've been saved, I want to be such a close approximation of Jesus that people look at me and see the beauty of Christ revealed in my words and my speech and my thoughts and my attitudes. And by the way, that wasn't just God's plan for Paul. Because Romans 8, 29 is for every believer. If you are saved, God's design, desire, and purpose for you is that you should be conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. But you also need to know, and, and a Christian pastor would be remiss if he didn't tell you the truth of sanctification. Sanctification is hard. It requires sweat. It requires effort. That's why Paul says of himself, his personal testimony, Colossians 1.29, for this I toil, struggling with all his, God's energy that he powerfully works with me. He says, I work really hard in my ministry, but I rely on the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through me. And don't just think that's an apostle thing. That's what pastors do. That's what Paul did. No, he commands us in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He urges us in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight. He didn't say play the good play. He said fight the good fight because it takes effort. And then Hebrews 12.14 instructs us to strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And then Peter echoes this, 2 Peter 1.5. He says, make every effort into cultivating godly virtues in your life. Make every effort means give maximum effort. You're beginning to see why Paul says, I press on, I press on. Why Paul demonstrated such Herculean intensity. Because he knew God's purpose for him as a believer would that he be transformed and look like Christ. You know, that level of intensity we find sometimes in our lives, or rather, I should say, in this world. So I think all of you know the name Kobe Bryant, right? The late NBA superstar. And you might say, you know, he was one of the greatest athletes in the world because he had unparalleled genetics. And that played a part for sure. But Kobe didn't think that's why he was so good. Actually, in 2016, he won the Icon Award at the ESPYs. He gets the stage, he gets the mic, he says, this is why. Listen to why Kobe, what Kobe attributed his success to. We're not on this stage just because of talent or ability. We're up here because of 4 a.m. We're up here because of two-a-days or five-a-days. We're up here because we had a dream and let nothing stand in our way. If anything tried to bring us down, we used it to make us stronger. And he's a marvelous example in the athletic realm of the kind of intensity that it takes to win. And when he did, and that's a picture of the Christian life. That's a picture of the sort of maximum effort and aggressive energy and fanatical devotion that Paul says characterizes his own spiritual life. It's a compulsive drive to excel spiritually. See, he's not Kobe Bryant trying to win sports superstardom. He doesn't care about human glory. What he cares about is that he might treasure Jesus the way Jesus is meant to be treasured. And he might reflect Jesus the way Jesus is meant to be reflected in his life. That he might live his life in such a way that others would see him and say, this is a man who prizes above all, above money, above pleasure, above comfort, above success. He prizes his savior. And I see that because of his lifestyle. And so the question for every Christian in hearing this text is to ask ourselves, to ask yourself, am I straining in my spiritual walk? Can I say that my, my muscles are feeling fatigue? That my breath is coming in ragged gasps as I not seek to win salvation. If you're a Christian, it's already been won for you. But as I seek to grow in my sanctification, as I seek to grow in godliness and holiness and righteousness, can you say there's a level of vigor and intensity to your pursuit of greater Christ-likeness? And let's be super clear. I'm not talking about earning salvation. Paul's not talking about that. He's already a Christian. He's saying, because I'm a Christian, I do this. Because I'm a Christian, I want to fulfill the purpose for which God called me. 
namely that I might look like Jesus. And so if you're hearing this and say, wow, that's, that's, that's tough. Yes, it's true. There is a strenuous nature to the Christian life. And it's not true when people preach and say, listen, to be saved, all you got to do is, you know, ask Jesus into your heart and then just do whatever you want. And when you're saved, it doesn't matter. God doesn't care if you live with your girlfriend. God doesn't care if you do drugs or, you know, cheat on your taxes or whatever else. Like, he just wants you to be saved and that's all God cares about. And you don't have to do anything. If you don't want to go to church, don't go to church. If it's too much hassle to wake up and read your Bible before work, well, don't do it. See, that, that brand of Christianity is not Paul's or the Bible's brand of Christianity because Paul says, no, no, Jesus is so valuable that I'm compelled forward in my Christian run. See, if you're going to enjoy the immeasurable pleasure of Jesus, if you're going to treasure him as the pearl of great price, then it absolutely requires us to press on. We got to go to war against sin with a holy fury that says, I can't be content with being a critical gossip or a slanderer or, or so selfish. I can't be content with these things. I want to press on and gain humility and, and love and sacrifice and selflessness and every other Christian virtue because our delight in Christ depends on our pursuit of Christ. If we say, I don't want to seek more of Jesus, then we will have little appetite for Jesus. So the glory of Christ reflected in this world depends on Christians saying, he's worth the effort. He's worth the effort. But it doesn't end there. Yes, there must be a holy discontent that says, I want to grow more. I'm grateful for what he's done, but I want to press on. And there must be a consuming drive that says, I will count the cost to advance. But it has to be paired with our third training principle, a radical concentration. Because see, if you have a consuming drive, but you get distracted, then your consuming drive doesn't count for much. So we must have a radical concentration. That's an unbroken focus, an unwavering gaze. That's an undivided attention. Well, on what? Paul explains, verse 13. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And it's interesting because in the original language, the two words I do aren't there. Your translator added that so that it makes sense. It's smoother in the English. But what Paul says is, but one thing. And yeah, that's abrupt and dramatic and emphatic. And yeah, it's meant to arrest and seize your attention. But one thing. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said, purity of heart is to will one thing. And then John Calvin echoes, we must take heed that we do not apply our mind or heart to anything that may divert the attention but must, on the contrary, make it our endeavor that free from every distraction, we may apply the whole bent of our mind exclusively to God's calling. That's why Paul ran with such zeal. That's why he said, I must have a radical concentration, an unbroken broken focus, because I want to be like Christ. That's his one thing, to be like Christ. And so he says, if I'm going to be like Christ, I'm going to have to focus. And focusing requires two components, forgetting and straining forward, forgetting and straining forward. So forgetting what lies behind, that's the runner who's running and he's not doing this. He's not checking to see where the other competitors are, how close they are. No, no, he's just sprinting with his eyes ahead. And for Paul to say, I'm forgetting what lies behind. What he means is not that I, I have amnesia. What he means is I refuse to dwell on the past. Well, what about Paul's past? What he refused to dwell on. Well, there's two things that could serve as baggage to Paul, like running with a backpack. Two things that would slow him down. One would be focusing on his past sin. He used to persecute the church. He put Christians to death. He blasphemed the Lord Jesus Christ. That could slow you down if you get too caught up in that. And so he said, I'm not going to dwell on that. But on the other hand, there's also this thing that could slow him down, and that would be dwelling on past success. And he had a lot of that in his 30 years of ministry up to this point. He could say, you know what? I've preached a lot. I've converted a lot. I've planted many churches, discipled many men. 
and I'm content with that. And I'm just gonna coast a little bit because I've earned it. He said, no, no, no. If I do that, that will cause me to become overconfident. That'll cause my pace to slacken. And because the prize is worth it, I don't want to slacken. So he says, I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to break my concentration. Because there was a guy who broke his concentration once. It was August 7, 1945. There were 35,000 spectators there to watch. They later called it the Miracle Mile. The two fastest runners in the world in the one mile. The only two men on the planet at that time who had broken the four-minute mile. The Australian John Landy, the Englishman Roger Bannister. They were going to compete. And Landy was winning almost the whole time. His lead was comfortable. The outcome seemed secure. Last lap, 90 yards from the finish line. Landy chances a look. Where's Bannister? He turns and he looks, and that's all it took. That half hesitation is what Bannister needed to spring past him, and he won the race by 0.8 seconds. And afterwards, Landy said, I would have won if I hadn't looked back, if I hadn't taken my eyes off the goal. And that kind of lament is what Paul says, I will not break my concentration because I do not want to lament Losing the race because I got unfocused. But it's not just forgetting what lies behind. No, he says, I must also, I'm straining forward to what lies ahead. The verb straining forward, the only time in the whole New Testament you find that particular word. It's very vivid. It's very graphic. It means to exert oneself to the uttermost. And the picture is of Paul, and he's running as hard as he can, and he's stretching his stride as long as he can, going as fast as he can. And his eyes are fixed ahead, and his body is leaning forward. And it's almost like his hand has reached out to grasp the finish line because he's marshalling all of his energy and all of his muscles so that he might complete the race. And this is all about effort and intensity and dedication and drive and focus and resolve. And Paul says, this is how I'm running my race. This is the level of concentration I'm maintaining. And it would be good for us to pause and say, is that similar to the level of concentration we are maintaining in our Christian race? because it's very easy to let our concentration be broken. I mean, this world is filled with things to break your concentration. Netflix and Apple News and Pokemon and fantasy football and the gym and everything designed to break your concentration. But there's also your own life, right? You have a past. Maybe your past is what's broken your concentration. And you say, you don't understand what I did before I got saved. You don't know that I had an abortion or I got divorced after six months. And I can't live that down. And I am running with a backpack loaded with baggage and guilt and shame. And you tell me I'm supposed to advance spiritually when I did those things. And Paul says, yeah, you got to forget it. You gotta let the grace of God cover the past and you gotta strive forward. But it may not be baggage in that form for you. Maybe your baggage is actually a life of spiritual success in the spiritual realm. And you're, you're living in the glory days, the afterglow of the past, and you say, oh, you should have seen me as a young Christian. Oh, wow. You know what? I read the whole Bible in three months, hours a day in Scripture. I was so fervent for Jesus, and I was discipling men, and I was evangelizing on the streets, and I was memorizing large portions of Scripture. And then you say, oh, my goodness, sir, that's phenomenal. How are you doing today? And he says, but then I was great. Because today, if I'm honest, I've lost my zeal. I've lost my consuming passion for Jesus. And once I sprinted, but today I crawl. Because I'm still living in the glories of what I once did. And the Apostle Paul says, I don't care what you're looking back towards. doesn't matter if it's sin. doesn't matter if it's success. He says, forget the past. Focus on the future. Don't let anything slow you down. And you say, okay, well, what do I focus on? And then he tells you in his last training principle, the last principle we have is what I'm going to call a finish line focus. This is what he looks ahead toward. 
a forward fixation on the finish line ahead. So you have a holy discontent and a consuming drive and a radical concentration, but you consummate it with a finish line focus. Verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that word goal, that refers to a mark on which to fix one's gaze. A mark on which to fix one's gaze. And in the context of an overtly athletic passage, what that means is it's the finish line. Paul's saying, I press on for the finish line. This is how I endure the cramps. This is how I endure the blisters. And this is how I endure the dehydration and the muscle fatigue because I'm looking toward the finish line. And if you've ever run a race or a marathon, you know what he's talking about. It's the finish line that keeps you moving because there, somewhere there ahead, you know it's real, you know it's out there, it's the finish line. And Paul's saying, yeah, it's not just the finish line. It's the prize on the other side of the finish line. Well, what is this prize that makes the finish line so sweet? Well, if you were an ancient Greek athlete, the finish line meant when you finished, when you won, they would summon you to stand before the judge's box, the judge's seat. And then they would crown you with the victor's wreath, which would be a a wreath of laurels. They'd place it on your head and it would be a testimony of your achievement. It would give you glory and honor. And historians say if you were in Athens and you won an Olympic event, they would also give you a sum of 500 drachmae. So they would enrich you with a large purse of gold and then you'd get a front row seat at the theater and you would be honored and favored by all. But is that really what Paul is running after? Is that really the prize that Paul says, I give maximum effort for that? No, he says it's the prize of the upward call of God and Christ Jesus. Simply put, this is the full and perfect realization of his his salvation. He possesses salvation already, but he says, this is when I will realize the fullness of it because the call in scripture in the New Testament is salvation. And it's an upward call and God is offering this and he has it, but he says, In this life, I haven't fully realized it. So across the finish line is the realization of salvation. This is 2 2 Thessalonians 2.14. To this he called you through our gospel. What did he call you for? So that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, when you finish the race, the prize is the salvation you already possess. You will enjoy it in all its fullness. And that looks like one perfect sanctification, which is what Romans 8 talks about as glorification. And then he says, I will enjoy perfect fellowship with Christ. There will be no sin to hinder my communion with Jesus. It will be perfect. It will be eternal. It will be everlasting. And that's a prize worth pursuing but it's not just for Paul. In most races, only one man wins. In the Christian race, every Christian wins. That's why Paul urges us in Colossians 3.1, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That's why Peter challenges us in 1 Peter 1.13, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why the author of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse two says, look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Because the prize is realizing the fullness of your salvation. And it's a glorious prize. Back when I was in seminary, like every seminary student, you spend way more of your life than you want to study. And so my spot of choice was the downstairs basement of the seminary library. And the downstairs basement was quieter and less foot traffic, fewer distractions. You could get one of these little cubbies where there's kind of half wooden walls. And so you're just able to kind of burrow into your books and your translations and all your assignments. But as you go downstairs to the library, to the basement, every time you'd pass on the landing a wall with a plaque. 
And the plaque had a quote by John MacArthur. And the quote was this, if you properly value the heavenly prize, it will compel you to give of yourselves and of your resources. Fervency springs from a vision of heaven's reward. Let me ask you, do you find that your Christian life lacks a little fervency? Do you find that there's not so much pep in your step or spring in your sprint? Well, then Paul says, it's because you may not have considered so well the prize awaiting. If you will meditate on the prize, it will give new life to your muscles and you will run faster because it's worth it. And so I would say, friends, if you're a believer, let's run and let's remember the prize. Yes, it's easy to forget in this world, but let's remember why we run. Let's remember the reward awaiting us and let's run with confident expectation of receiving the prize. It's not if you will, you will. So let's run until it is our actual possession. And then I would say to you, if you're not a Christian, if you've never repented, you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then what I would say to you is your race, you're chasing a prize that will be as ashes in your mouth. You may get it, and it may be a marriage, it may be success in your career, it may be a family and picture-perfect children, it may be to retire and play pickleball every day and you're the legend of Gilbert. And I will say to you, even if men tremble when you go to Gilbert Regional, (laughs) that is worthless if that's your prize. If that's what your life is about, you are running a race of no consequence. And Paul is saying, you need to run after that which is truly precious and valuable. And the only thing which is truly precious and valuable is the Lord Jesus Christ. But you cannot even enter the race without repentance and faith. So so repent today. Apprehend Christ today. Take Him as your own through faith. And then you will have the equipment needed to run the race and to win the prize. And don't you want to win the prize? You can. If you're a believer, you're already running. And the prize is there awaiting. And Paul says, I will give you my protocol to ensure that you win. And you win in grand fashion. A holy discontent, a consuming drive, a radical concentration, and a finish line focus. Run with me and let's do this, he says. But then there's sort of an interesting postscript to these verses because he doesn't conclude his thoughts there in verse 14. Actually, his thoughts drift into verses 15 and 16. And I find it so fascinating that when he gets to verses 15 and 16, he feels the need to issue one more charge, one more summons. And he basically says this in verse 15. Listen, Philippians, true maturity is not reaching perfection. True maturity is knowing you haven't reached it, but yet having the commitment to pursue greater Christ-likeness. That's what I'm doing. That's what mature believers do. And he says, but some of you may not want that. You may not value heaven's prize. You may not be running hard. You might be stuck in the past. And he says, if that's you, I've endeavored to change your opinion through this truth, but I know that I can't, so I'm trusting God to do it. I'm trusting that God will operate in your heart like a surgeon and he can adjust anywhere you're off. And then in verse 16, he says, don't let up. For those of you who are running, don't let up. Stay the course. Let's run side by side, march step by step together. We will reach the finish line and it will be glorious. And the only question for you to answer is this. How am I going to respond to Paul's rousing cheer? Let me conclude with the story of a man who responded. Eric Liddell, famous Scottish printer. They called him the Flying Scotsman because he was blazing fast. And if you ever saw the movie Chariots of Fire, then you're familiar with the fact that when he competed in the 1924 Paris Olympics, his two best events, he didn't even run in because it was held on a Sunday. And he said, I won't break my conviction to run. 
So instead, he trained in the months prior to run the 200 and the 400. And he was an amazing athlete because even though those weren't his races, he won bronze in the 200, gold in the 400, and oh, by the way, set a world record in the 400. But that wasn't even his most impressive race. His most impressive race was the Christian race because Liddell was a believer. In fact, he was born to missionary parents in China. At the age of five or six, he moved to the UK. And so it was fitting that as a son of missionary parents, after he got his degree, he said, I'm going to go to the mission field and I'll go preach Christ where he's not named. So he got on a boat and then he sailed to China, 1925. And then he spent years there serving and laboring. And he finally met a young beauty by the name of Florence McKenzie and they developed a relationship and in time they got married. They started a family. It was blissful. Had two daughters. She was pregnant with a third. But then things became not blissful because then Japan became very aggressive toward China. And the British consulate said, listen, if you're a British citizen, you got to get out of Japan or rather get out of China because Japanese aggression is going to turn out poorly. So, so leave the country. Liddell says, sweetheart, you and the kids got to go. We got to send you back to Canada, back to where she's from. And he says, I will meet you there. I'm going to stay and finish the work. I'm going to preach the gospel and serve the poor. You get on that boat with our two precious daughters and the one in your womb, and I will see you in Canada. And do you know what? He never saw them again. Because in 1943, the Japanese army interned him. And they put him in the Wysine internment camp with about 1,500 other foreigners. But he didn't stop running even then. His race didn't terminate. No, you know what? In the camp, he was known affectionately as Uncle Eric. Because Uncle Eric taught Bible classes and Uncle Eric cared for the children. And he was the godliest man anyone in that camp had ever seen. But it was hard to run the Christian race in there. And conditions were poor and food was scarce and life was hard. And so it is, sadly, that at the tender age of 43, February 21st, 1945, Eric Liddell died of a brain tumor. And you might say, well, it was over. And I'd say, no, it wasn't. It just began. Because when he died, as it were, he just stepped across the finish line. And then the Lord Jesus received him and brought him to heaven. And I wonder if when he stood at the gates of heaven, as he was there, did the angels congregate? And they said, guys, look. And they whisper and they say, that's the man who pressed on so that he might win the prize for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he has it. And don't you want that to be your testimony when you die? Let's pray. Father, it is a very stirring call that Paul issues to us. And I think in our hearts, we want to respond and we want to run and we, we want to honor Christ and the salvation he's granted us by living for him and serving him and growing in godliness. But there are so many hindrances and obstacles to the Christian race. Even good things can become hindrances. And I would pray that for my own heart and for the hearts of every man, woman, and child in this room, that we would embrace the race as Paul did. And we would say, I'll keep pace with you, Paul, because Jesus is worth it. And I'm looking forward to the day when I'll be in heaven with Christ. And I'll be there forever. And I'll know the matchless pleasures of his presence. May that stimulate and motivate us today and tomorrow and every other tomorrow until we cross that finish line and receive the prize. Would you accomplish this in our hearts so that it might redound to the glory of Jesus Christ? in whose name we pray, amen. Hey, 
Thanks for tuning in to our Redeemer YouTube channel. If this is helpful for you, please make sure that you like this video, smash the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon. It will help us reach more people with biblical truth. Thank you so much.